thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me. Here I am. Um, so I'm going to take you during this uh, little bit of a time uh, through like what is this thing about AI, what is this thing about machine learning, what is this thing about robots. In fact, the title of the talk, which was translated into Dutch to something else, is Towards the Lasting Human-AI Interaction. That's what I'm going to try to tell you about. And uh, in some sense, throughout the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about like 40 minutes or something, uh, save your questions, and then at the end, I'll be happy to answer the questions, but let me just go through the whole thing. So, and uh, I will also tell you uh, several topics, and I assign homeworks also, so be ready, because throughout the talk, pay attention, I do not grade them at the end, so you all get an A. Anyway, so let's just focus first on what is this thing about AI. AI is in some sense, exactly what the term means, which is some level of intelligence which happens to be artificial from the point of view that is not in a human body, but it's kind of a machine. However, this intelligence uh, in humans has to do to the fact that we are not remote controlled by anybody and we have the ability to have perception, cognition and action. The ability to really interpret the data around us to actually make decisions and to move or speak, or eventually we can close this loop by ourselves. This is something that's called autonomy. So we are kind of autonomous because we are capable of doing this. AI, uh, whether we like it or not, I do like, uh, aims at creating these machines that are cap capable of processing data, uh, being able to make decisions, learn, and eventually actually making those uh, action selected. So this is kind of like what I would like you to, to understand and then uh, in the questions we might, might explain better like the difference between AI and machine learning per se, but that's like this integration which is putting these capabilities all in a machine, that's the challenge in some sense of AI and that's why it's complex. So, uh, so uh, AI also another dimension is that, and this is a lot of what I've done in robot soccer, which I'm not going to mention, to show today, also is about coordinating with AI, uh, other AI systems. So people talk about AI, but AI is not just a one great chatbot or a one great recommendation system or a one great virtual assistant to the doctor. It's actually how do you have them talk with each other? From a technical point of view, that's really a challenge too and coordinate, and especially what I'm going to focus on today is on also how does this coordination, uh, how is this coordination with humans? So the talk is basically only about telling you uh, this aspect of how robots can service, can interact, and coexist with humans, and this is based on work that I've done at Carnegie Mellon with several of my students, as I will explain. But so this is the, this is like the, the, how do you say, the focus here. I could have told you how do they connect perception with cognition and action and everything, explain the technical aspect, but I'm just going to focus on giving you examples of this coordination with humans and what does that mean, okay? So let's start by thinking about this robot. This is what we call a cobot uh, at Carnegie Mellon. We built them. And as you see, this machine looks not like a human. And I actually like robots that look like robots li or like a you know, refrigerator on wheels or whatever they are. So, uh, so things that are very distinctive. There are other researchers in robotics that like to make them like, look like humans. That's their choice. I like them to look like this. And then they have, like, beautifully, some kind of, like, perception. And now this perception, their eyes, is kind of this camera down here, which happens to be a connect. And if there is, like, people that play Xbox or whatever that game is, that's what this, this machine is. It's a very powerful camera, I'll explain later. They have all their thinking in some kind of laptop on top of them. And they have all their action, these robots basically move. And as they move, they also can speak. But their actions are basically just moving and speaking. So they have this perception, cognition, and action, and that enables them, in some sense, to move in our buildings by themselves. So, you know, I came uh, this morning from London, actually, 
and I go through these airports, and I get to Copenhagen, and I got to my hotel, and I enter this building, and I did not see a single robot. It's sad, right? At least to me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you are always hoping that there is some kind, but there is nothing. Nothing moves by itself in the world, except maybe the Roombas. And if you don't know what's a Roomba, that's homework number one, Google Roomba, and find out what are these, uh, you know, vacuum cleaners that we have or lawn mowers. But, I mean, it's, isn't it, like, amazing that we are in 2018? And, yes, we all have our cell phones, but you go through everywhere and you don't see a single robot moving. Not a single one. I was looking, nothing. Anyway, at Carnegie Mellon, though, so there are these robots, and the beautiful thing that we are going to try to understand is how are these what are they? And I have to tell you one thing. Although there is a video of this robot, which meant that there was someone taking the video, they, you, they basically move by themselves. Nobody's behind them taking videos. We just took the video so you could see. So what do they do? These are machines, robots, that can do this thing which is really remarkable, which is process data, whatever they sense, and I'll show you what it is, and in real time, which means that they don't have to stop and think, oh my God, I don't know where to go, I don't know where the walls are, where are the chairs, I'm going to bump into these walls. And they have this sensory data and they do it in real time, this processing information in real time. And, you know, we have to understand that the motion part is the same way as autonomous cars. The challenge of the motion is not hitting anything. So they are basically trying to find where are the obstacles in the world and make sure that they move in open space. That's, they are not uh, doing anything smarter than that. We take it for granted. I tell you, if you tell me, Manuela, go to the door, I guarantee to you that I'm going through this open corridor and I'm not going to bump into all of you sitting there. Now, this is like taken for granted that humans can do this, and I know exactly where's the open space. The whole research of mobile robots in, in includes having a machine figure out that this is open and that part is not. So many of the things in robotics and AI are things that we take for granted we can do, but to have a computer do it is very hard. So now I'm going to challenge you with the, basically the only technical slide of the talk, or more technical. So I'm going to tell you how this, this robot moves, so let me just stop this. So this is a, an, uh, an illustration about what's inside of the robot when you saw it moving down those corridors. So the, the computer has a map of the building, really just an architectural floor of the building. Why is a map important? It's like a map of a city. Um, the map is important for two things. First of all, it tells the width of these corridors and tells where are openings. So here it's an opening, there's an opening, all these things. So if by any chance the robot is able to find out where it is in the map, given what it's perceiving, then it knows how to plan its route down these corridors. Do you understand? So basically what this robot is doing is always trying to, these mobile robots, to estimate its position given what it's sensing, nothing else. Now I want you to look at something else. Look at that little kind of like uh, set of little orange circles. Those orange circles mean that the mobile robot, while moving, has uncertainty about its exact location. So the robot thinks that it can be in any of these positions. In fact, you don't see, but there is some orientation also. And it's confused. It's confused. No, the confusion is not that he thinks he's here or there or here or somewhere. It's all around here, but it matters. In fact, it's a big kind of confusion matrix that, you know, it, it just keeps, conf it's confusing. So you have to understand this is important for, in general, if you have an AI system, AI has always, in some sense, uncertainty given the data that it has, always. Now, the beautiful thing, oh, here it's what it's seeing, but for now, forget it for, I mean, you are going to see in a second. I just want you to see. The beautiful thing is that as it moves, uh, it, for some reason, it, this is probably glass, it didn't detect well, but there is this crucial moment in which it detects that wall over there, given this image, it's this green thing here, for, this is the floor, but it detects that thing there, a piece of wall, at some distance, and now we can say, well, if I see something at that distance, I'm a little bit more sure where I am, 
And as eventually the data comes in and more wall is detected, and especially a beautiful corner is detected, it knows exactly where it is. Do you understand? This is what you have to remember. Is this is like the, the, this is AI at its best, just to tell you. Because it's a machine that's like making inferences, trying to get, is confused, not very confident, gets more data and becomes more confident. And then it goes down, and maybe then later loses again track for a while. So it's this cycle of getting data, uh, increasing confidence, and eventually making decisions. And this thing here does turn extremely well here because it detected the, the, the actual corner. Do you understand? So this little video, uh, or this animation gets, gives you a feeling for exactly what's inside of these computers as they move. Do you understand? So this, but this is true also if this were not a, a mobile robot, if it were an AI system, uh, you know, uh, analyzing a lot of data of another nature, uh, data about temperature, about climate, they might be lost because the data doesn't match. What is this thing about the not seeing? Is that the data does not match the model? So the robot is lost when it doesn't find any data that matches the map. So it's like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be here. I don't see anything. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And then suddenly you see, matches the model again, and there it goes. Is that clear? So, so that type of like navigation enabled the robot to move in our buildings for an eternity. It has been moving for more than a thousand kilometers, continues moving as we speak, even if I'm not there uh, every day, I'm on leave from Carnegie Mellon, but it moves, I have many students there still working with the robot, and it has moved in our buildings for more than a thousand kilometers. So there is no reason there is here the, the provost of the university, I believe, the rector of the university, there is no reason not to have robots here. Okay, so, you know, your corridors are wide enough, this is all beautiful. So, it will have a little problem with the stairs, but you can take some elevator. Anyway, so, uh, this is very important, and this is a different environment. This was at NYU, where I was on sabbatical some years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, and then it here is like the robot moving in very, very different uh, uh, perceptual, you know, large corridors, a bridge full of glass, and light, and the, the robot still uh, moves reliably in this space. So this is, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, for us to know, several PhD theses, at least three PhD theses, to get this to this point in which they can go. Now, however, now comes the bad news, or, the, or comes like the reality. So they move really well, but you know what? They have a lot of, a lot of limitations. So, in particular, they literally cannot go upstairs. They cannot open doors. Even if we think that we could learn how to open all the doors, you know what, I was able to open all these doors without any problem. To have a robot actually open all the doors, even if it would have a manipulator, it's hard. So this took my sleep at night for a long time, thinking that this is it. We'll never be able to have anything that can do it all, that can understand, that can uh, open doors, that can move in the environment. And then we at CMU, uh, Carnegie Mellon, invented this concept of they ask for help when they cannot do. Uh, so here is the first kind of like this AI, human AI interaction. Think about the problem I've, I mean, think about the opportunity of having a machine that can help you, but you know it cannot do everything. If you are supervising the machine, it's a lot of work. But if the AI system can say by itself, oh, I need help here, it's remarkable. So this is what I call not autonomy, but symbiotic autonomy, because they are in this symbiosis with humans and with other robots. So this is like a novel human-AI interaction, and this is what you have to understand. The reason why, in some sense, we don't see more robots here is because we don't acknowledge that they have limitations. If we would let them go and they would stop there in front of the staircase if there is no elevator, and they would say, hey, please, pick me up and put me up there. Okay, pick you up, put you up there, done and then they can continue. Because they will have inevitably, all the time, these stretches of things that they cannot do. Do you understand? So that's uh, very important to see and to acknowledge that these AI systems will always have limitations. And who, which human does have limitations? I do, 
many. I mean, I do speak with his accent. You know, you could say, you know, tell it again. I cannot understand what you are saying. That's fine. Or something, or I mean, I'm not tall enough to reach things. I have to help someone to help. I don't play, I play squash, but I don't play basketball. I don't play other things. So we have tons of limitations. Who can do it all? And we ask help from people. And I don't know many things, and I ask for help. So here is how the robot actually moves in the building, taking the elevator, for which it cannot press the elevator button. So it actually stops in this hallway and basically say, can you please push the up button and hold the elevator door? It doesn't even know if there is a human there, but it just says, can you please push? And here is Stephanie Rosenthal, one of my students, and Joy Deep will show up in a second. And the, it, the robot also asks, which elevator is going up, the left or the right? It doesn't have a camera to detect which elevator is arriving. The human says the right one, and the robot goes in by itself. It only needed to know which one, and nobody is pushing the robot into the elevator. And now, inside, it also cannot press. Can you please press 8 and tell me when we get to that floor? And eventually, it does. Do you understand? This is remarkable, the fact that we can let the robot go because it can ask for help when it needs help due to its limitations. And it's not us who are there to help. Is any random person in the building helps the robot in this task of taking the elevator. Now, this task in particular is something the robot cannot learn anything about because by you pressing the elevator button, it's not the case that an arm grows on the robot to because it now knows how to press the elevator. That's it. It's an intrinsic limitation and nothing can do to help. However, all the cognitive limitations, for example, here, I'll show you this. If you tell, go to the small size lab. Where should I go? And the robot said, I don't know what small size lab is. Uh, go to this small size lab. I do not know that location. I don't know. Room now, the, the so Tom, Tom Collar, gives this four digit room number, which is something that the robot knows. So, magically, everything that it asks that is of the cognitive nature, it absorbs and learns. And basically, here is a representation so you know. So it says, forget location, ground zoo, but small size lab is now 7412 with some kind of confidence. Doesn't matter, some kind of value. And every time that you are going to say something related to small size lab, this robot is going to say, do you mean 7412? And here it is, for example, and here is another example. So here, please bring a coffee to the lab. And here it is, it's like going to say, please bring a coffee to the lab. Now, it's going to complain and, and say, I don't know this object. What is coffee thing? I will search the web. It's going to search the web to know if coffees are in the kitchen, office, meeting room. It, so now, so you, you, you know, you actually, you know, it's actually interesting. Uh, you know, it's difficult to have these robots say this. And if you go there and ask, uh, bring me chocolate, it's going, if it didn't learn yet where chocolate is in the building, it will go and ask. Everything that you tell, it absorbs. Which location do you think it's best? Office and kitchen came with the same probability. This is a thesis of Mehdi Samadhi, another student of mine. And the human says, Tom, kitchen. Okay, look at this. This time, it is offering. It did not know it's coffee, but lab, it's thinking. Is this what I learned before, that it's 7412? And it's saying, room 7412, is that correct? And the human says, is that correct? Yes, the human says, yes. Yes. Yes, that's correct. And now, the robot knows everything. It knows where to go, what to pick up, where to deliver, and it executes the task by itself. Now, you can ask, can you, can, can you tell me how is this machine going to get coffee? How can it get coffee at the kitchen? Ask for help. Very simple. So it's always in this business of asking for help. Now, it gets there to the kitchen, and gets to the kitchen, and basically says, this is Mehdi Samadhi. Hello, could you please put the object coffee in my basket? And press then when I'm ready to go. So, and then uh, Maddie puts the coffee in the basket, and there you go. So, 
and now it's going to the lab room for everyone, and he's like announcing the whole thing. You know, I'm doing this. Am I right or wrong? But so, but you know, in some sense, this is like um, uh, the ability to do to do tasks by itself. And I don't. Um, I I brought the object coffee from the kitchen, room 7602. Now it knows to so your room. Um, thank you. That's it. Okay. So do you understand? So, but the nice thing about this is that this is like one episode that we actually captured, but this robot in, intera in interacting for, with humans in the environment, which we don't have videos for, accumulated more than 10,000 facts about the world. Go to Manuela's office, the office of Professor Veloso, go to the conference room, uh, where is the office of, uh, of uh, everybody. So it knows, uh, go to the small conference room, go to the large conference room, go to the Any English, any language, it translates the language to its own representation, which is these room numbers, and is able to reuse all the time. So it started tabula rasa, knowing nothing about the actual environment, and through this interaction it learned. The learning here is very simple, and it's basically a learning like here is like a coffee. There you go, 7602 becomes some number, 2.32. Now, the learning is about keeping the, all these structures going and if actually using them. So this is the concept of actually when you don't know, you ask and you can absorb what you don't know. I'm going just to show another video of a different robot because I want to illustrate other ways in which humans can actually teach robots and they can learn. And this is a wonderful example. Not many people have seen this, so uh, you, I really want you to see this. So this is a very beautiful example of uh, my student, Trevor Rhodes, teaching a robot how to pick up you know, some type of like, here is rice or something from this specific uh, location. But I want to explain you something. So there's rice, and it's supposed, so it's all, see, here, instead of just seeing cognition or pressing the elevator button, it's the same concept of a human helping the robot, and it actually is taking the arm of the robot to pick up from there and put here. Now, I need you to explain this. What happens is like this, when, the human explains this. This is actually because we are working on robots that feed handicapped people and all sorts of disabled, and it's a very beautiful project. But when the robot actually, when the human does this, the robot knows a lot, knows the weight of the rice, 18, 18 grams. This is not something that the human knows. Knows the cost of this action in terms of its joints. And it's actually going to very nicely uh, so the human does, this is what it means to take something from one place and put in the other place. And now this robot, which actually is called Pepper, executes and tries to see if something like, look, it's now the cost is 18.6, it changed slightly what the human said to see if it's still okay. And it asks the human, did that trajectory also good? Because that's a little bit cheaper for me in terms of energy. And, uh, and the human said, yes, that trajectory was fine. Now it tries to get very little rice and just puts it everywhere and it's not very good. <laughs> so, and now the human says, hold on, that trajectory was not satisfactory. And after several iterations, the robot converges to this kind of much less costly, much less rice, a little bit less, which is optimal from its point of view, and it's still within the range of the demonstrations of the humans. This is wonderful. And in fact, if you see, the, this is just a technical thing, it doesn't matter, this is how it computes the cost, and here is some trajectories that the human gave, and then the robot does it slightly different. And this is also, again, this human-AI interaction. When the human taught the robot to do it, it kind of forced the arm to go like that, but it did not know that it was very hard for the robot to do that. It does not know, because it's kind of like a different, a different uh, mechanics. And so the human and the robot are trying both to converge. The human says, no, 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 you are throwing the rice away, or very little rice, or whatever. They are trying to converge to something that it's both acceptable by the human, and the robot finds that it's best, better than just the plain demonstration the human did. Do you understand? And this is a, a very beautiful concept of, again, this interaction between the humans and the robots. 
So, uh, so, human, so robots service humans, humans help if asked, and humans question autonomous robots. Now, this is a very important topic now. So we talked about uh, this uh, integration of perception, cognition, and action that enables the robots to go everywhere. We talked about their limitations. We introduced this concept of symbiotic autonomy. And now we are in the third topic, which is like, the, I believe, the last. So basically what happens is the following. The robots are autonomous. What it means, and this is why we have so much trouble with this thing, what it means is that they literally disappear. So when I'm in my office and the robot shows up, then it goes down this corridor, I still can see it going. At the end of the corridor, it turns right, and I don't see it anymore. I can still hear these robot wheels, but I cannot see it. And then literally everything is gone. The sound, the vision, I don't know where it is. So the question becomes, how do we get these things that do things by themselves be more transparent? and explain, wow, what are you going to do next? Why are you late? Or what happened by the elevator? How long did it take you to arrive here? All these things are things that the robot experienced and you now want to know what's happening. Do you understand? I mean, like if you have an AI assistant and you say like this, go and find me like the hotel in, in Paris. And then the thing goes and then it comes back to this hotel and says, why this one? Why not another one? this problem of transparency in this interaction with AI. So now, are you all sitting down so you don't fall at the next slide? So this is what is the internals of a robot. It's a mess. And this is just when, so, they, they, they think numbers, you know? They think like this, uh, what is this? Point cloud mean square error 2.061, what is going on? So. We program robots and everything, like distance to obstacles and so forth, is kind of a language that is completely uh, unknown to humans. So with one of my students, Vittorio Pereira, did the thesis on how do you translate those internals of the robot to natural language so that the robot can tell you uh, verbalization is what you call that when it goes down this corridor and, uh, you know, X, Y locations, think about that the robot only thinks like uh, numbers, like uh, zero, zero is where I am, minus 30, minus 20. It keeps moving in the space of numbers as it goes, and it now is able to actually come to my office and say, I went straight for 15 meters, then I turned left, then I straight for 51 meters, and then I turned left, then straight for 10 meters to reach the destination. It's not really Shakespeare, I tell you. <laughs> but it, at least, at least, and it translates into language whatever it did at its brain level. And this is very important to understand that if we have an AI system that's doing some deep learning or that's doing whatever it's doing, it needs to tell us something. It cannot just say, this is it, and not explain, not uh, be able to answer what if scenarios or not respond. So a lot of the research in AI have to do with this transparency, the ability to do this. And uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, even this turn left is a difficult kind of concept because uh, the numbers change and then they have to change significantly to, for the robot to decide that actually the numbers match into a left turn. Uh, and eventually also because of deep learning, which is a technique to really classify objects in the environment, the robot now moves and it sees a kitchen, it sees a microwave, sees a sink, and eventually has knowledge to say, I should be near the kitchen because I see both a microwave and a sink, and it can say, I passed by the kitchen. I believe I went by the kitchen. Uh, or there were people in the kitchen or it now relates because of the vision, which I don't have, I can explain later uh, in the questions, but it's, that's, that's, but that's like a, this wonderful uh, research problem of trying to translate the internals of this AI into language. Is that clear? Okay. So the last, I mean, I'm just going to, to, to focus on two slides on just telling you about this education problem. So, so this is a just to finish. Uh, so, in some sense, now there is something really beautiful in being in this room uh, with so much history, uh, we should understand. So, when Gutenberg 
uh, invented the printed pre I mean the printing. Uh, magically, if you go to the history of the of, of, of science, people started to learn how to read before Gutenberg. Basically, only monks and uh, uh, philosophers and professors in universities or whatever, some educators knew how to read. Basically, the people would not have to learn to read. Because Gutenberg, through technology, makes such, uh, make re books available to everyone, reading became a skill. So now you wonder, now that we actually have so much data, so much AI, so much tools, what is the new skills that people need to have these children learn in addition to reading, writing, math, geography, history? There is n one more new skills that people have to learn. And I just give you as an example here, our children, if you have children, if you have grandchildren, if you have uh, even yourself, you should start being in this business of counting. You should start being in a business of thinking that you can plot distributions. How long does it take to go there? How long many times did we do this? this this, this ability to analyze data and to understand distributions and to be able to predict based on the distributions is a fundamental new concept to, to have. So it's not only knowing that 4 plus 5 is 9 or 3 times 7 is 21, it's also having these children, uh, having ourselves understand that the world is about now being able to, uh, to count and to to understand distributions, to be able to predict based on the distributions. And this is like something that was thought to be some skill that only statisticians or mathematicians or eventually computer scientists would have, but it's not the case. Everybody now needs to understand a little bit more about data, okay? So, and then there is a, f a fundamental concept that people have to understand, which is uncertainty. So that is the little kind of example with the multiple orange circles, and there is a concept that many of the things that eventually uh, we know about have uncertainty, which is like, they vary like this. It's not always like that. There are levels of uncertainty. So if you want to predict, there is uncertainty. So uncertainty, representations, data distributions, understanding all how to predict based on those are skills. And so in some sense, the educating for AI involves this ability to be able to search, to do heuristics, to have decision making, to have values. We can talk more during the question period, and I'll mention this again uh, more. What does it mean for an AI system to have values and applications? Uh, so just to finish, I am in JP Morgan now, and uh, JP Morgan is a very large bank. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to understand how can we make uh, something of, of the size and scale and impact in society that financial services have be more digital because all the other companies, Googles, Amazons, Twitters, Facebooks and so forth were born digital already. Everything else that existed, hospitals, banks, construction, agriculture, energy, all of that existed before the computers came and eventually the iTech came. So AI has a lot of, in financial services have a lot of uncertainty, a lot of human-machine interaction, they are very complex, and they fall into the same model as AI for robots. It, they have data and models, they have to do decision-making and learning, and they have to act. So this is like what I am, uh, for the last uh, six months, trying to understand. Of course, I cannot tell you yet much. If you invite me in 10 years from now, I'll probably give a talk basically on financial services if I stay at the bank, uh, I'm on leave from Carnegie Mellon, and, but I have, do have 30 many years of research in robotics. So in the areas in these, uh, th that you focus on is data, the problem of data, learning from experience, explainability, and values. So in conclusion, these, uh, these, this is what we've learned today about towards this lasting human AI interaction, which is AI is somehow an assistance as complex, uh, is assistance in terms of integrating data, decision making and action. It had, there is this symbiosis between humans and AI. Uh, they learn from instruction. It's very beautiful, the fact that you can actually teach these robots. 
or these AI systems, and you have to worry about interpretability, transparency, and explainability. There are many students I want to thank. Uh, these are like some of my robots, some of my students. I do have many robots at CMU. Let's see, there are four cobots, not just one, and, uh, and, uh, and many other robots and many people. And, um, and that's it. Thank you very much.